So I'm Jonathan Cross, I'm a musicologist from the music faculty here. I work principally on 20th and 21st century music, but uh, I've long been fascinated by the relationship between mathematics and music, going right back to medieval times, right through to the present day. Next year, I shall have a year's leave where I'll be a research associate at an institution called IRCAM in Paris, which was founded in the 1970s and was initially built underneath, uh, in a bunker, underneath the Pompidou Centre in the centre of Paris. But I like to think it's a kind of uh, postmodern idea of... of uh, the medieval relationship between uh, between the sciences and the arts, where 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 technicians, where theorists, and where practitioners all come together. So, what I'm sure you're wondering might random music actually sound like? Well, <laughs> now that wasn't actually a performance from the American composer John Cage's famous or notorious, as you would have it, 4 minutes 33 seconds of 1952. It wasn't a performance because there was no uh, uh, explicit involvement of a, of a performing musician, but the effect may not have been so different. Uh, what, what were we hearing? Well, uh, some nervous laughter, the, the hum of the, uh, of the projector. Maybe um, your neighbour's tummy gurgling, not had chance to have the sandwiches. If you were listening really closely, you might have heard the, the beating of your own heart or perhaps the buzz of your, of your uh, nervous system. Now, none of these sounds is necessarily randomly generated. You know, we know how the heart works. But they're coming together in this moment, in this place, is unpredictable and unreplicatable, if there's such a word. <laughs> but is it music? I hear you ask. Well, John Cage reckoned that it could be. Let sounds be themselves. That was his famous rallying cry. Sounds of whatever kind can be wrested free from uh, authorian, authorial, inten authorial intention and take on uh, a life of their own. He invites us to focus on those sounds as I uh, rather naughtily invited you to do just now by removing such sounds from their functional context and placing a frame around them uh, he identifies them as part of a musical performance they become something quite different in other words now of course the very decision to place a frame around them is in itself an authorial act and therein lies the contradiction cage the composer the performer or performers and whoever chooses to engage with this work, and I use that word advisedly, bring, if you like, order to randomness. Now, you may be interested to know that there is actually a published score of this work, 4 minutes 33. The original version, and yes, there is also a revised version, but the, I checked yesterday, the original version is on sale uh, at the current price of 12 US dollars and 75 cents, if you wish to go out and buy a copy. And this is what the front cover looks like. Uh, try hitting that. What do I hit to make this move? I don't know. Is the answer? Uh, left, right. Ah, oh, there we go. Okay. So there's the front cover. Uh, now, as you can see, it's got the composer's name emblazoned in large letters across the the front. They're not quite the removal of the ego of the composer from the act of composition as he might have claimed. Um, and when you open the score, what you see inside is this. So the Roman numerals represent the three movements of this work, and the instruction tacit is what uh, an orchestral player would see on his or her part uh, in an orchestra when they're not required to play for an entire movement. Uh, it's the usual lot of the brass player. Rather unusual to have the entire work represented as tacit here. So what interests me here is that Cage seems to be playing with the traditions of Western art music, certainly as we've inherited them from the 19th century. The published score with its highly sophisticated notational conventions, its clearly defined time frames, as we have in this particular case, and so on. The score is an almost transparent mediator between, well, to put it in its most contentious, between the intentions of the creator and the interpretations of the executant. And what Cage does here is to highlight in a vivid way the tensions between, if you like, order and randomness. Tensions, as we've already heard from Ian, are inherent in the basic fabric of the universe, and which, 
well, I would say this, wouldn't I? Music represents extraordinarily well. Here's another example from around the same time. This is a more composerly approach, if you like, to dealing with randomness. This is a work from 1956 called Pithopracta, meaning Actions Through Probability, by the Greek composer Yanis Tsenakis. And here's a graphic sketch of just eight bars of this piece, where uh, time is represented on the horizontal axis and pitch is represented on the, on the vertical axis. And he used probabilities to control musical events. Rates of pitch change are randomly distributed according to Maxwell Boltzmann statistics, which Alison, I'm sure, will tell us is usually used to, to uh, model molecular velocities in a gas. I felt he once said that I could solve the slow change in the large masses of sound events only with the help of probability. So to put it very crudely, the overall direction of the music in time seems to be ordered, but the local content is random. Compare this with, say, the stochastic motion of water droplets in a waterfall. The shape of the waterfall is relatively clear, but the, the movement of the droplets within that is not. What might this sound like? Well, if you, if you listen very quietly, I'll just play you a minute's excerpt from this. What you hear doesn't quite correspond with what you see, because this example is so quiet you wouldn't hear it at all. So I'm just going to play you a minute from towards the end of the piece, but the principles involved are exactly the same. It is a work for full orchestra, and it sounds a lot louder than that in reality, but I hope you get some sense. We couldn't have a talk on music without hearing some sound. So the notion of the work that I invoked a moment ago is actually a recent phenomenon in music, dating, well, at least if you believe the philosopher Lydia Gurr, dating from around the uh, early 1800s. Music moved from the social to the aesthetic. It took on an autonomy. And this idea of the work has proved to have had a, a powerful regulatory force on the ways we understand music and the ways we might think that we hear music. Symbolised by the score, as we saw in Cage, we've come to think of Western art music as something fixed, unified, teleological, highly ordered, the exemplars being, well, the so-called uh, heroic works of middle period Beethoven. Think of the Fifth Symphony and the way that it, it moves from beginning to end. But can this really be so? <laughs> Such a position would suggest that there's one correctly ordered way and one way only of performing and listening to such music. Does the work collapse if one wrong note is randomly played in the middle of the Eroica Symphony? Does the work collapse if we start thinking random thoughts about our supper, let's say, in the middle of a performance? Edward Said once wrote of Western classical music as uh, performances of Western classical music as extreme occasions. Every live performance is unpredictable, both for performer and listener, which is why I like Said's idea. It's as if in performance, music represents an extreme moment poised between the apparent order of the score and the potential randomness of its realisation. So a precarious balance is maintained between coherence and collapse. Art, and especially music, but art brings order to the inherent randomness of the universe. Nietzsche recognised this in his famous early essay, The Birth of Tragedy Out of the Spirit of Music. At a point when the will is in the highest danger, art approaches as a saving, healing magician. Art alone can turn those thoughts of disgust 
at the horror or absurdity of existence, randomness, into imaginary constructs, order, which permit living to continue. So to misappropriate Nietzsche's terms, randomness is the Dionysian, order is the Apollonian. Both are required in balance to permit living to continue. Now, for the 28-year-old Nietzsche, this meant Wagner's music dramas. But for our purposes today, I wish to propose that music at its best, like science at its best, constructs a reality for us, as Ian was saying, out of the chaos of the cosmos. Cage and Xenarchus do this very well, in the process drawing to our attention the myth of the work. Music as a constructed, aesthetic, performative and social phenomenon, music can show us how to live meaningfully in a random universe. That's my eight minutes. Thank you very much. <laughs>